everyone welcome back to my channel if you're new here my name is Caitlin and on this channel I upload all sorts of content relating to true crime education and psychology topics and I also do have a second channel if you aren't already aware where I upload beauty fashion and lifestyle content so if you want to see some more content from me then definitely check out the videos I have over on that channel I'm back today with another psychology video but this one is kind of interlinking I guess with true crime because we're going to be talking about something called homicidal sleepwalking or homicidal somnambulism I did recently ask for suggestions on both my Instagram story and on my community tab on my channel relating to psychology topics you want me to cover and someone very very kindly um, suggested this topic so thank you if that was you um, I started sort of getting into the research and I fell down a rabbit hole it was just so interesting so I've got a lot of information that I want to share with you guys today before we get started I'm just going to very quickly shoot through my usual disclaimer that I like to include at the start of all my videos just letting you guys know that I'm not claiming to be an expert in this case or any of the other cases that I cover over on my channel I'm simply relaying information I'm able to find myself through research of certain sources on the internet and in particular with psychology cases. I do just like to stress that I do have a psychology degree. I graduated last year with a Bachelor of Science but that does not mean by any means that I am an expert in psychology. I'm not a professional psychologist. I'm just simply aiming to cover sort of the basics and an introduction into these concepts themselves so you guys maybe if you haven't heard of any of them um, you can kind of get like a low level understanding. So none of these are very complex. They're not very advanced uh, discussions. They're just sort of basics and with this case we are discussing the basics of the concept itself but also some specific cases that displayed the concept in terms of sort of true crime and law so there's a mixture in this but I just want to let you guys know that I'm not claiming to be an expert. So with that disclaimer out of the way we're just going to get started discussing the concept of homicidal sleepwalking. So what is homicidal sleepwalking? Homicidal sleepwalking is more officially known as homicidal somnambulism and it is quite literally the act of homicide during a sleepwalking episode or state. It is quite a rare occurrence however there have been a number of cases throughout history where individuals have invoked something called the sleepwalking defence during their murder trial. Like I said at the start, during the video I want to cover these individual cases or just some of these individual cases as well as discussing the concept itself and the idea of someone being blamed for something that they may do while asleep as well as eventually looking at sort of the implications of such acts. So the first sort of area that I'm going to discuss is the idea of whether or not you can be blamed for sleepwalking crimes. As I said, there have been a number of cases in history where the killing of an individual has been blamed on the perpetrator, having been in a sleepwalking state, but this isn't to say it's a black and white concept. Sleepwalking itself has been the subject of many research studies over the years in an attempt to understand it and, and measure it scientifically, while also aiming to provide an understanding of what can cause or trigger an episode. It is typically found that the most common cause of sleepwalking episodes is a severe lack of sleep or sleep deprivation. It has been shown to be entirely possible for chronic sleepwalking to be a hereditary condition, aside from other factors having an influence like stress or fatigue, but it is also possible for a select few uncommon cases to be triggered by things like changes in environment, illness, disorders like sleep apnea or even certain noises or external sensory stimuli. In the majority of cases, sleepwalking episodes will mostly trigger acts like sitting up in bed, talking indistinctly, accidental urinating, possibly walking into a different room of their home and sort of general clumsy behaviour and not like responding to others if they're speaking to you. But something that does make this topic quite interesting to consider is the idea of lucid dreams. So these, if you don't know, are a dream in which an individual is maybe aware they're in the dream or they may have some sort of control over things that happen in the dream. So whether that's like conversations, choices they make or even the environment they're in. And so when we bring this back to the concept of homicidal sleepwalking, it does raise questions regarding lucid dreaming and the possibility of the individual having some sense of control in their dream state and subsequent actions and how we can prove that. But the difficulty is regarding homicidal sleepwalking is... How can you prove that one, the act was in fact committed in the state of unconsciousness and two, if this was the case, how do you then prove whether or not they had some level of control while in the state? But now what I want to do is go into some of the cases that have happened over time where they've reported someone invoking a sleepwalking defence during a murder trial or claiming that they were unconscious while committing the crime. This is not all of them. There have been quite a few. I mean, they're in a whole quite a rare occurrence, but um, there have been a number. So I wasn't going to go into 
all of them, especially since they all all kind of go along the same sort of route, but they're definitely interesting and it kind of helps you understand how it can come into play in terms of criminal law. So the first case is that of Albert Tyrrell and to my knowledge I believe it was the f one of the earliest cases. The case of Albert J Tyrrell was in fact the first case in US history in which the sleepwalking defence was successfully used in a murder trial. There is very little known about Albert Tyrrell himself since the trial did occur in 1846 and it took place in a place called Weymouth in Massachusetts but, but it is known that he did have a far-reaching reputation for being particularly reckless. A year prior to his trial, he had left his family for a woman named Maria Ann Bickford, a young prostitute who was living in Boston, Massachusetts. She was known to be a beautiful young woman who made a living working in a brothel, catering to particularly rich customers, and Tyrrell had met her and fallen in love instantly. He had moved himself to Boston in order to be closer to this new love of his, and it's believed that she did feel the same way about him, although she had continued working in the brothel to make her living. And because of her profession, she lived her life quite comfortably, she adorned herself with expensive clothing and she even had her own maid. And there aren't really a lot of details known about the crime itself since, like I said, it had been so long ago, but it is believed that on October the 27th in the year of 1845, Tyrrell had entered into Maria Bickford's room inside the brothel boarding house one evening following an appointment that she'd had with a customer of hers. He'd used a razor to cut her throat and then he set multiple fires inside the brothel building before then walking out of the building and away from the scene of the crime. The owner of the brothel had managed to wake up at the smell of burning and he'd managed to put out the fires before they'd grown too big and this is when he'd come to discover the remains of Maria Bickford. He'd alerted the police of what happened, not entirely sure who was to blame for the murder but once the police had collected the accounts of people inside the brothel as well as passers-by outside of the building, it became clear to them that many people had witnessed Albert Tyrrell enter and leave just before and after the crime. The police had set out in the hunt for Tyrrell but he'd already been on his way out of Boston heading in the direction of Weymouth, which is where his wife and kids were living. From here, it's believed that he then travelled to New York City before finally settling in New Orleans. But Tyrrell didn't have much luck evading the authorities and on December the 6th of that year, he had been tracked down and arrested. Police had transported him back to Boston where he would be placed on trial for the murder of Maria Bickford. His trial had been postponed for six months following his arrest, during which time he had enlisted the help of a man named Rufus Choate to aid him in his legal defence. Rufus's plan of defence for the trial of Tyrrell had ultimately taken the basis of Tyrrell having been a chronic sleepwalker and the murder he had committed had been done so in a trance, thus rendering him not responsible for the crime. The trial initially saw a number of witnesses called to testify having seen Tyrrell that evening in and around the brothel around the time of the incident and ultimately this began to kind of build a particularly strong case against Tyrrell. The prosecution had called a woman named Mary Head to testify and she told the court that she lived not far from the brothel boarding house where the crime had been committed. According to her, Tyrrell had rung the bell of her home the morning of the murder and when she'd opened the door he simply looked at her and made a strange noise before asking, are there some things here for me? The woman had been taken aback and stated that she'd become frightened by the man because he appeared to be in a strange state, saying that he acted as if asleep or crazy. Following this, Tyrrell's brother-in-law Nathaniel Bailey had stated in court that he had seen Tyrrell when he'd arrived in Wayne following the crime. He had told his brother-in-law that he had been fleeing the authorities but he had only stated that this had been on an adultery charge and when Nathaniel had informed him of the news of the murder of his mistress and how he was to be arrested, Tyrrell had reacted in complete shock as though entirely unaware. Tyrrell's defence team had continued their argument by dragging the name of the victim through the mud, stating that Tyrrell had been a man of honour and he'd been an upstanding citizen to all those who knew him prior to meeting this woman. They followed this by repeating the scenario in which she may have cut her own throat in order to frame Tyrrell for her death. And after sowing this seed of doubt in the eyes of the court, they introduced the concept of somnambulism, albeit a strange route to take. A number of Tyrrell's friends and family began to give accounts of strange behaviours he had displayed following his first state of sleepwalking when he was just six years old, states which had been infrequent but they had only become more frequent as he aged. 
There was one incident specifically recalled in which he had grabbed a brother of his, pulled a set of curtains off the wall and smashed through a window, as well as pulling a cousin of his out of bed and then threatened them with a knife, all allegedly while sleepwalking. A number of his family members who had witnessed these states told the court that they would only know that he was in a state of sleepwalking when he began speaking in an unusually high and shrill voice, as well as acting very clumsy and unpredictable. A specialist from Harvard Medical School had testified to support these claims as being in line with someone in a somnambulistic state, also telling the court that someone in such a state would be fully able to get dressed, travel about, murder someone and set fires before escaping, all while being essentially asleep. The final statement made by the defence had been that somnambulism explains killing without a motive while premeditated murder does not. Following a two-hour deliberation, the jury ultimately gave a non-guilty verdict and Tyrrell was a free man. Interestingly though, it's not really relevant but I just thought it was interesting, following the verdict, Tyrrell had made a request for his legal team to refund half of the fees that he'd paid them as he told them that convincing the jury of his innocence was not difficult and it didn't justify their fees. The next case I'm going to discuss is that of Simon Fraser and this case occurred in Glasgow in Scotland in 1878. By this time, Simon Fraser was 27 years old and married with an 18-month-old son. On the 10th of April 1878, Fraser had awoken at 1am, pulled himself out of bed and walked into his infant son's room. He then proceeded to pick up the child and swing him around when the boy's head was then hit against a wall. And virtually immediately following the incident, Fraser had not at any point denied what had happened to his infant, only that he wasn't aware that he had been doing it. According to Fraser, he had believed that he was defending the family from some creature that had entered their home and started attacking their son. And as it would turn out, Simon Fraser had been experiencing somnambulism for some time. And this had not been the first unusual incident he had while asleep, but sadly it had been the worst. He'd suffered from severe nightmares frequently ever since he was a young boy. And during his trial, his father testified by sharing a memory of when his son was just 14 years old. And he'd woken up to find his son sat on top of him, beating him with his fists, all while in a state of sleep. His sister had had a similar encounter when they were younger and she recalled having woken one night to Simon in a state, attempting to strangle her. Another had been that a young Simon had to be pulled out of the sea in a state of sleep. And while in this state, he had thought that he was jumping in the sea to save his sister who was drowning, although she was safe and well back in the home. Each of these incidents had been followed up with claims that Fraser had not been aware of what he was doing to his relatives, but rather believing he was in a nightmare and defending himself or the family members from various attackers. Two doctors were featured in this trial and they had opposing views on the incident, with one claiming that Simon had been clinically insane and the other stated that he wasn't. In this case, the jury didn't take anywhere near as long whatsoever to deliberate and after a minute or so of deliberation, they returned with a not guilty verdict. They believed he was entirely sane, just not responsible for his actions during the incident in question. Following this verdict, there did remain a lot of concern that he may end up committing another awful act while in another state of sleepwalking, and there were talks of something referred to as a special arrangement being organised to prevent this. It wasn't ever publicly known what this arrangement had been, but it was believed that he continued his regular day-to-day -day life during the daytime, while at night he slept in a room alone that was locked from the outside, with his wife being the only person who had the keys. The next case is that of Steven Steinberg, and this case takes place in a place called Scottsdale, Arizona. Arizona in 1981. Steinberg had allegedly murdered Elena, his wife, using a kitchen knife, but he'd done so by stabbing her a total of 26 times. In 1982, Steinberg was taken to court and he did publicly acknowledge the murder, but claimed that he had done so while sleepwalking and he wasn't aware of what happened at the time. He ultimately pleaded not guilty to the crime as he'd never denied it occurring, but he had not been able to remember actually committing it and he was, and he was too found innocent on the grounds in a form of temporary insanity. The next case is Kenneth Parks and this is probably one of the most commonly known cases of homicidal sleepwalking and it takes place in Toronto and it begins in 1987. 23 year old Kenneth Parks was struggling with a severe case of both insomnia and anxiety and, and these troubles were met with further strife when he ended up being unemployed and faced with increasing gambling debts. In May of 1987, Kenneth had gotten himself out of bed and driven a significant way to the house where his wife's parents had lived. Once he arrived, he removed a tire iron out of the boot of his car and he'd used his copy of the house key to let himself in. He'd headed straight to the bedroom where he used his hands to choke his father-in-law until he lost consciousness 
consciousness before using the tire iron to brutally beat his mother-in-law. He didn't stop there though and he proceeded to remove a knife from the kitchen and stab them both. Before leaving the house, Kenneth had headed to the kitchen where he picked up the home phone and put it straight back down but not in the receiver, so not on the stand, and it remained off the hook. He then ran straight back upstairs and stood outside the bedrooms of the teenage daughters in the home but he simply stood there for a moment before running out. Kenneth had gotten straight into his car and he'd begun driving when at around 4.45am he'd arrived at the closest police station. He had been covered in blood and he immediately confessed to an officer and this was the exact quote that I could find online, I just killed someone with my bare hands, oh my god I just killed someone, I've just killed two people, my god, I just killed two people with my hands, my god I've just killed two people, my hands, I just killed two people, I killed them, I just killed two people, I've just killed my mother and father-in-law, I stabbed and beat them to death, it's all my fault. At some point during the incident he'd actually torn some tendons in both of his hands and police responding to the incident said that he seemed shaky and overly distressed but he wasn't aware of the pain he'd caused himself. This particular point in the case is known as dissociative analgesia which is when the feeling of pain is entirely dulled without any form of medication or external influence. And this has been commonly linked to states of sleepwalking, although it is worth noting that it can simply occur following drug use or when an individual is in an extreme state of shock. In order for Kenneth Parks to prove that he had not been responsible for the attacks using the invoked sleepwalking defence, he was required to participate in multiple tests and sleep studies in order to establish whether there had been any unusual brain activity while he was asleep. And this was ultimately supported by the EEG scans that were collected by the psychological tests. And this combined with the lack of any other answers that could have been followed and proven by authorities, it was ultimately agreed that he had in fact been in a sleepwalking state. The case of Michael Rixgers takes place on December the 26th in 19. 37 year old Michael had shot his wife in the early hours of the morning and in his trial in September of 1994 he claimed that he had not been aware of carrying out the act rather that he was sleepwalking. Similarly to the other cases this had been argued by his defence lawyers in court but this time they had specified that he was suffering from sleep apnea and the lack of consistent oxygen flow to his body while asleep had been what caused the unusual episode. However unlike the previous cases Michael was found guilty and sentenced to life imprisonment for the murder of his wife, although following his sentencing he had attempted to appeal his case. And the next case occurs on January the 16th in 1997, when Scott Falater had climbed into bed like any other evening. Except this time, all he remembers past this point is waking up with his home being surrounded by police officers and being placed under arrest for murdering his wife. Valata's wife, Jan Miller, had been stabbed a total of 44 times and then drowned in the pool in the house's garden, and the neighbours had been the ones to alert the police after hearing a commotion and screaming. When authorities arrived, they found Scott and both of his children fast asleep inside the home while Jan Miller was found in the pool. According to the reports, Scott had made an attempt to discard of his clothes that had been covered in his wife's blood as well as cleaning the murder weapon thoroughly before washing the blood off himself and then he'd gotten back into bed. There had been witnesses to parts of the crime that night as some of the neighbours had looked out their window after hearing some sort of commotion and seen Scott walking in and out of the house wearing gloves on his hands and some had then seen him dragging his wife out of the house and holding her in the pool. According to Scott, he and his wife of 20 odd years had been happy together, they had no history of any problems whether that be money, abuse, unfaithfulness, nothing. They had allegedly started planning their future retirement plans together and spent a lot of their free time together with their family and in the local church. These claims seemed to be supported by records claiming that the police had never been alerted to the family or called to their home at any point and everyone who'd known the couple had said that they were in fact happy. And just like in the other cases, the question hadn't been whether or not he had perpetrated the crime, but it was the aim of the investigators to establish a motive, and in this case there didn't seem to be one. And when it came time for the trial, Falata at no point had denied having been responsible for killing his wife, but he did repeatedly say that he had no recollection of doing it whatsoever. He had told the court that he had suffered from somnambulism all of his life, and it worsened as he got an older in the sense that the episodes became more frequent. And these claims prompted his defence team to use this argument in court calling in sleep experts and professionals who did say that it was a rare occurrence but it was entirely possible. But ultimately the jury had not agreed with the defence team that this was a likely defence in this case and in June of 1999 Scott Falater was found guilty of murdering his wife and sentenced to life in prison. The next case I'm going to discuss is that of Stephen Wrights. So in October of 2001 25 year old Stephen Wrights had beaten and stabbed his girlfriend Eva Marie Weinfurtner to death while they had been on a weekend 
bombed away. He'd smashed a flower pot against his girlfriend's head, dislocated both her elbow and wrist before using a pocket knife to stab her four times in the back of her neck. She had died as a result of the stab wounds and after finding her body on the floor of their hotel room at around 1am, Wright had headed straight to the nearby fire station. Authorities had immediately noted the injuries on the victim as being potentially related to the perpetrator's profession. So Stephen Wright had been an avid shark fisherman and sailing instructor and the stab wounds had appeared to be similar to that that is used to kill sharks. He had initially said to the authorities that he thought he had killed her, although he had no memory of doing so. All he remembered from that night had been a dream in which he'd fought off an intruder in the hotel room. As it would turn out, he did also have a history with sleepwalking states and he was also receiving medication for bipolar disorder. According to Wright's that prior evening, he had forgotten to take his medication and instead his girlfriend had given him a pill that she was prescribed to help her with anxiety. So in addition to him taking medication that hadn't been prescribed for him and forgetting to take his own medication, the pair had also been using recreational drugs and drinking alcohol the evening prior to her death. He was convicted for her murder, but he was at first sent to stay temporarily at a sleep clinic in order for further tests to be carried out. And these tests not only proved that he encountered frequent states of somnambulism, but he also suffered from extreme outbursts of night terror. His sleep disorder had ultimately been proven by these tests, but Stephen Wright was sentenced to 26 years to life in prison for the murder of his girlfriend. And the final case example that I'm going to cover is that of Michael Catling. In August of 2003, 28 year old Michael Catling had attacked Samantha Vines, the mother of his infant daughter, in her home in Dorset, England. He had stabbed her 10 times while she was asleep and cut her throat. The pair were no longer together, although he had been sharing her home with her that evening in order for them to look after their 18 month old daughter. According to Catling, he had absolutely no recollection of the attack on Samantha and he believed this was because he had taken at least six sleeping pills, around 14 pints of beer, and and taken some of his antidepressants before heading to bed. Following the attack, he'd put his daughter in their car and driven to the police station nearby, but he had actually crashed the car on the way. He eventually made it to the police station, but he was covered in blood and he had told officers that someone had broken in and attacked Samantha in her home. But when the authorities arrived to the scene of the murder, they found Samantha on the bed with her wounds and a kitchen knife still sticking out of her and a bloody handprint on the wall, which was Michael Catling's handprint. His defense in court had attempted to invoke a sleepwalking defense argument but experts had ultimately determined that this was an inaccurate cause and as a result he pled guilty to murder. Michael Catling was sentenced to life imprisonment in 2005 with a minimum term of 13 years before the possibility of parole. There are numerous more cases that I haven't covered in this video as I don't want it to get like too repetitive but there are a mixture of outcomes with some of the cases being successful in invoking the defence while others not so much. But these cases, although not too common, do tell us a lot about the working of the subconscious mind and things that can occur in a state of sleep. Something interesting to consider in terms of the implication is the difficulty the concept can have in relation to law. As I'm sure you can gather, the concept isn't black and white in terms of law, so in some cases there could be no proven evidence of episodes of somnambulism being present, while others could prove that they suffered from sleep disorder, but it might not have actually helped them avoid the guilty verdict. In short, invoking a sleepwalking defence and being able to prove the presence of a sleep disorder does not necessarily lead to an immediate acquittal. Since in the majority of the cases that I looked at, the perpetrators had not denied being being responsible for the attacks only that they could not remember it. It's a difficult argument to approach. From what I can tell, in most cases, if there is a proven presence of a sleep disorder, the main concern is the possibility of another attack occurring once again due to the somnambulism. But these individuals are believed, or even proven in some cases, to be clinically sane. And so it's difficult to approach, especially with sleepwalking not being curable or even possibly manageable. As I said, there are a lot more cases than those that I mentioned in this video. And from what I can tell, there have been numerous where the presence of a sleep disorder couldn't be proven. Introducing the prominent concern that some perpetrators may attempt to invoke this defence in an attempt to lessen their sentencing. But with the ever advancing research focusing on sleep disorders, I believe it's something that maybe could become slightly less of a grey area in the future. And that is where I'm going to end today's video. Um, I hope you guys found this interesting. I'd love to know your guys' thoughts on the concept and these cases down below. Thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you guys very soon for another video. Thanks for watching. Bye!